In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer four fitness and health questions from listeners. What is he for? Just like you. But the way we open the episode is by talking about current events. We tell funny life stories. We have great conversation and we mention our sponsors. So here's what we talked about in this episode of Mind Pump. I start out by mentioning a crazy, crazy new supplement that I just started messing with. You're going to have to listen to the episode to find out, but it's gross. Of course you try. And it's weird. Um, That led Adam to talk about the new documentary on Amazon called Sups. I can't wait to watch. I'm a huge fan of the supplement industry, which is kind of cool, which brought me to talk about protein powders and their qualities through the years. I mean, when I first started taking protein powders way back in the 90s, they were basically dry milk powder. They were disgusting. And if you wanted to go with a vegan protein powder, because I had an intolerance to dairy that I figured out later on, uh, it was like ground up dry soy. It was a terrible quality. It wasn't Blah. good. Well, these days you have uh, quality products like Organifi's plant-based protein, which has a mix of plant-based proteins to give you a good amino acid profile. And it tastes really good. That's the other thing. I remember the old protein powders. Yeah, thank uh, God. You deserve to build muscle if you could stomach those things. But the new ones are really delicious. Anyway, Organifi is one of our sponsors. They make phenomenal supplements. If you want a discount uh, off their products, here's what you do. Go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump and use the code Mind Pump for 20% off. Then I talked about the conversation I had with Doug in the car on our way up to our house up in Truckee. Um, And we were talking all about trigger sessions. That's a concept found in MAPS Anabolic. Very effective uh, technique you can use on any workout to amplify the muscle building and fat burning signal that you send with your normal workouts. Then we talked about a Russian training technique that the Soviets used to dominate weightlifting. Then we talked about the show, The Biggest Loser. Oh, yeah. They just had their premiere the other night. Um, Our good friend Erica is on that show. She's one of the trainers. We love her. Uh, The show, quite entertaining, but we have our criticisms. You have to listen to the episode to find out. Then we talked about Allstate's Mayhem advertising campaign. It was pretty brilliant. And then I talked about the high-protein demonization that is starting to happen. So stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. They will be demonizing protein next. They did it to to carbs and fats. Proteins are all that's left. Then we got into answering the fitness question. The first question had to do with painful joints. This person's joints hurt, and they work out, they take fish oil, they stay hydrated. They want to know what they can do to get better joint health. In the, that portion of the episode, we talk about correctional exercise. That's one of the best ways to solve joint pain. Then we also mention certain supplements that you can take. Uh, I mentioned Organifi's Move. It's a combination of four supplements. There's turmeric in there, holy basil. Pycnogenol is also in there. Holy basil. All proven to help regulate your natural inflammatory response. Again, that code I mentioned earlier works for that product as well. Then we talked about how to connect to muscles and why that's important to developing. The the question was, can you build muscles that you can't connect to? So we talk all about that. The next question, this person wants to know what our thoughts are on the carnivore diet. Some people call it the lion diet. This is where you eat only meat. Wait for it. Yep, that's it. Just Uh, meat. Nothing else, so we give our opinion there. And the final question, this person wants to know how often you should take diet breaks and how long they should last. We talk all about diets, breaks, not having breaks. Are you on a diet at all? Do they even exist? Yeah, we got real philosophical uh, towards the end of that one. Also, everybody, listen, you have 24 hours left. One day left for the 50% off maps hit sale so maps hit is a workout program that's all based off of high intensity interval training so high intensity interval training made a lot of waves years ago because they showed that 20 minute hit workouts burned as many calories as 40 or 50 minute traditional workouts in other words burn as much body fat in a shorter period of time now the problem is if you do hit wrong you can hurt yourself or you can have your muscle your body burn muscle as well as body fat. So what we did is we designed a HIIT program that helped you build muscle, burn body fat, take advantage of the the, how HIIT burns a lot of calories. So we did it all the right way. So when you get the program, there's video demos, there's workout explanations. Basically, you're hiring Adam, Justin, and myself to train you through MAPS HIIT. Again, it's 50% off. The sale will end 24 hours of the launching of this episode. Here's how you get your discount. Go to mapshit.com. That's M-A-P-S. 
H-I-I-T dot com and use the code HIT50. That's H-I-I-T five zero, no space, for the discount. Anyway, I did something uh, the other day that I haven't done in a long time that I used to do a lot. What's up? So I used to, and this is just, it was a fun thing that I did. I just don't have the time anymore to do this. Mm. Um, but I used to, back in the day. Hang <clears throat> upside down and, and whack it. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going for it. I'm I've never done right that. Now. No, I've actually never, never done, done that. that. Yeah. One of those vertical machines? <laughs> no. Okay. Just as like that's what I did. Yeah. Uh, no, Try I. It out. <laughs> yeah, no. I wonder if it'd be hard to get an erection like that. I bet it would. Because the blood has to go yeah, higher. Yeah. 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 Mm. And what happens when you? Finish? That's how the astronauts do. Uh, that's what I heard. No, it's, <laughs> that's not, not the same thing. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, what I used to do back in the day is I would go online, and I would read forums or uh, reviews to learn about new and up and coming trends or especially supplements because I would always learn about a new supplement on the forums before it became kind of a big mainstream yeah. kind of thing. I'd read about it first and I'd read people's reviews and then I'd learn the history and then you'd have to di- you know you dive in on the internet and do all that stuff. So anyway, I did that again with a, another supplement. So I was reading some forums on obscure supplements that I'd never heard about, and I came across something called, I'm going to read the technical term, and then I'll tell you guys what it means, uh, Polyrachis vicina. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. So P-O-L-Y-R-H-A-C-H-I-S. Polyrachis vicina. Vicina. And this is a- Bee's vagina? It's a, It's not that. <laughs> Sounds no. like that. No, it's Do not they bee, have them? A yeah. vagina? Yeah. No, I don't know. Okay. Bees have a vagina. <laughs> Uh, but it, this supplement, this herb or whatever has been used in Chinese medicine for centuries. It's known as a very, very potent key booster of your life energy. Mm. It's got a yang component. Spit it out. What is it? Hold on. I'm not done. Uh, <laughs> So it's supposed to boost uh, libido, energy. It's supposed to be very powerful from what I read. It's even ranked higher than ginseng, which ginseng is extremely prized in Chinese medicine for its mm. qi and yang boosting. Some exotic animals privates. Qualities. So, That's what I was thinking. You know, it's like sounds, sounds the like, go-to. So I read you guys a technical term. The actual, the, like a layman's name for it is black ant extract. So black like, ants? Black ant extract. So, like the the, the the do they have like a poisonous venom or anything in them? They no, can, they like literally take extract? a ter- a a certain species of like ant, juice them, and no, they just fucking grind them up. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yes, mm. it's ground up ants. The specific type of ants. Why? That well, they've been using it for centuries. Well, you remember there's like those uh, those birds, right? That intentionally go and they and they scoop all the ants underneath their wings. And then the ants like sting them, and it gives them hot, gets them high. Well, have you ever uh, seen yeah. that? Yeah, yeah I've seen I have. That. Well, ants have. I mean, they're high in nutrients and all stuff. And, but I don't think that's what what's producing the the results or something else. So anyway, I'm looking this up. And I'm reading all these reviews. Yeah. And people are like, "Oh my god, this raised." I mean, my, my libido went through the roof. I love this as a pre workout so much. I mean, tons of reviews. I went on Amazon and I found their product. I looked up every product that sold this. And I looked up all the reviews, and the majority of them were good. I went on forums. I looked at Chinese medicine and read up about it or whatever. So I did this a while ago. So I'm like, I'm going to try this out. This is kind of interesting. So I ordered some. Of course was, you did. No, you didn't tell hey, us. Of course no you did. affiliation. <laughs> we're not working with no company. I'm not right. selling this. I've only tried it once, so this is not me. But I tried it, and I swear yeah. it legit has some weird stimulating properties. Really? Like, yes, dude, I took a half a scoop and it's black ants. It's so gross. It's powder, dude, right? what? Yeah, so I took it and I drank it and 45 minutes later. Do you, you I'll have to add that to my rhino ball powder. Dude, <laughs> 40. It's bull semen, isn't no, that what it is? No, it's not a bull semen. Yeah. What's, what is it? Well, that that used to do? Well, I, bull semen's only effective if you get it out uh, naturally. Right. <laughs> Yeah. I was watching, so the the I got tagged on a new documentary on Amazon, The Sups. I haven't called. seen it yet. Really, oh. I tell you what, really good. Really, you, you liked it. I loved it. What I loved about it, let me okay, let me, hold on, let me back up a little bit. I loved most of it, and the whole first half of it is literally like the history. And oh, they, it's going to be nostalgic. Oh, then. you're going to love it. You're gonna love it because a lot of the things that Do they go all the way back to the snake oil. They go they go back to the the very beginning to the very first 
uh, examples of any sort of supplements mm. and the evolution of it and where where it came from. All the, and they step you through the introduction of protein, who were the big ones, why they were the big players, how they marketed and advertised. Oh, beautiful. Oh, it goes into – it's really a cool yeah. – Weeder was the first marketing genius in the supplement space. He was the be- one of the best, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they talk uh, – they, and, they and go, then Bill Phillips they, were just they, invented the modern supplement they industry. Go, they go through each and every one of those. They actually uh, talk about a couple that I, I wasn't familiar with and I've never heard you talk about before that rivaled them actually around that time and, and why they did. Do you remember and, their names? Uh, if you said them, I would know, but I don't know. I can't remember the name. Did they mention like Dan Duquesne? Oh, and, yeah. Oh, it was oh. all about him. Oh, wow. He was all in it. Oh, no. Everybody we've talked about, uh, about the history of supplements, uh, it's right in line with everything we've discussed, but even more detail around it. And they go deeper with the marketing genius behind it and the people that were behind all those those uh, companies. And they talk about back then, you know, the there was this opportunity for, you know, a science guy, a marketing guy. Um, to to pair up, and that's what just made these companies dominant. And Bill Phillips was an example of that because the team that he had surrounded around him, he had like the best doctor at the time in the protein world. Mm -hmm. They were doing some of the best studies like back then, and then he was a marketing genius. And then the that's the formula: you take a little bit of science and you market it really well. Was he the MetRx guy? No, that was Doctor Scott Connolly. Did they talk about him? Yes, they got into yeah. Metrics. Metrics Metrics, was one of the first companies to present their product in that way. Yep. You know, scientifically, metamycin in protein, and it's supposed to work yeah, differently. They talk than, all about that. Cybergenics, they talk all about. Uh, right. they, oh, yeah. I, oh, and when they start using transformation picks and all oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. They got into that. They got into the- um, That's so funny. I did cybergenics. They talk about the, uh, what's the, or- the orange pre-workout, the first <laughs> yeah, pre-workout. Ultimate Orange. Ultimate Orange. Dan Duquesne. Yeah. That was the first one that had like ephedra They in discussed it. all about fe- ephedra and its benefit, all that. So they, they went, it was a great documentary. Actually, probably one of my oh, favorite. Cool. I'll have to check that out. Uh, the only thing that I had, uh, the- then so the first 30 45 minutes is all that thing is phenomenal uh and then it did cause me to start going down the rabbit hole of like okay who funded this who is because then they start like m- m- the whole time it's almost like they're mocking uh supplements like how it came to be mm. how it was all it's all hype it's all built around and so and i then love they sell it at the end and then they kind of like sell sell it at the end a little bit <laughs> you know what i'm saying so yeah. i was like okay so somebody's behind this somebody who is a part of this of course is is connected for sure to some and uh, i was suspicious of what's the cat's name that's over the caged muscle guy okay i don't know his name but i know who you're talking you know about. who i'm talking uh-huh. about right i can't even think of his name mm-hmm. right now tattoos mohawk mm-hmm. like i can't think of, uh he was featured in it quite a bit and when they started making the case for different types of creatines that's when i went like okay here we go mm-hmm. and that's he he makes it he makes a case for his pro, his creatine in it towards the end and i thought oh, okay i wonder if he's tied to creatine some. is a is a wonderful case example of how the supplement industry will take a product that is a blockbuster and then branch off of it to continue to sell you off of the yeah the blockbuster itself so like creatine was one of the first supplements that actually built muscle it's it was by i mean besides protein right like protein helps build muscle if you eat a high protein diet and one of the ways protein powders can help is if you can't get a, a, all that protein through diet so they even tell the story on how bill phillips uh first came up uh, with creatine and the it's uh what's the what's the bodybuilder's name that's uh, uh he's russian milo milo or milo uh Sarchev? no Mil- no no milo no 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 I'll, I'll think of it um anyways old 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 russian bodybuilder guy uh he's not old but older build a uh, rush uh, russian bodybuilding guy he came over from Russia and was giving Bill Phillips injectable creatine mm. and said that, you know, told him all the benefits of it. And then uh, this other company sends over uh, an example of uh, a powdered form. And he's te- he tells him, he, Bill Phillips says to him, like, man, if this was in powdered form, this would go bananas, mm-hmm. right? Uh, do you have it? No, we don't have it. It's only injectable over there. So that was the end of the conversation. And then a company sends the powdered form to him. It sits under his desk for like a year. Wow. Doesn't even use the creatures. That was his blockbuster. Oh, it was. That's what made yeah. it. Oh, yeah, it was everything. It, mm-hmm. it, it exploded and went gangbusters. Well, again, creatine is a great example because here's a supplement that actually worked, that was legal, that it had no negative, necessarily negative side effects or whatever. And so at first, when he first sold it, it was expensive because he was the only one that had it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Then everybody started you know, producing it. And so companies are always trying to figure out how can we 
j- how can we jump on this bad wagon? So they started coming out with different versions, and they would sell the different version, like creatine citrate and mixes better in water, or this is buffered and this is a different mm. one, and this one doesn't cause bloat. Yeah. And uh, it, but the funny thing is, creatine monohydrate time release. Yeah, good old fashioned monohydrate is the best form. Yeah, and they kind of they kind of mention that in the in the show, and then that, then maybe ten minutes later, they're all of a sudden then they're filming guys making cases for the different types. Of it's creatine. funny because uh, Bill Phillips was the I want to say the editor of Muscle Media two thousand. Yes, he which, owned the magazine, right? Which was the that magazine in those days was the black sheep yeah. of the fitness space because they talked about steroids. They talked about drugs. They talked about all the crazy sides of that. Well, you whole actually, space. you want to know what they attribute Bill Phillips doing the best about mm-hmm. as far as his marketing that was so unique and different. Joe Weider was the first and brilliant who owned his magazine line, had all the bodybuilders, muscle and fitness. But and he flex. spoke to the body. But he used all. He had all the pro bodybuilders. He had Arnold. He had all the big names. Oh, body for life was all. And what Bill Phillips mm-hmm. did was introduce it to the masses. And mm-hmm. they say that he's arguably right. Joe Weider, they we give all the credit to in the supplement world as being the OG and original guy to really start to put it on the scene. Bill Phillips is what took it to what they believe to what today is today. If it wasn't for him, it would still be this niche product that is just 100%. The bodybuilding. He started to make, he would use just kind of models. He would use fit people, not people that necessarily won a competition or were famous in the bodybuilding world. He just used great bodies and physiques. He did two things. <laughs> he did a supplement review that he would sell as a book. And it was a review I own, I own the book. of supplements, mm-hmm. but it was owned by him. So, of course, the products that they had were always at the top. Very, very brilliant marketing. Then he had the Body for Life Challenge, yeah. which actually reached a lot of everyday average people. Right. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, it got more average people to lift weights than anything else that that space had done. Well, and that's, the, that, that's why they were making the case that he arguably was one of the most important people in this whole, the whole storytelling is, you know, what he did for everybody else besides the the group of people that but, were. But boy, the, the pro- have products changed. Cause I remember the first protein powder. I started taking supplements young. I was 15, maybe 16 years old. And my dad, you know, he had a weight set and he, he had bought one bottle of protein powder and it was the one with weeder, you know, with his arms flexed like this. And it was called muscle builder. That was the name of it. Oh uh, yeah. And so I saw that. No 5,000 or no, anything no. at the end? No, just muscle builder. They always added all that Old school. End. And I thought, oh, this is this is the secret to Mega making it buff or whatever. And I started taking – and really what it was was it was uh, like dry powdered milk. I mean, it wasn't a lot of ingredients. It was very basic. It all originated from Ovaltine. Yeah, cra- yeah Ovaltine was the first Ovaltine one. Ovaltine was the first one. And uh, when they they saw the formula for Ovaltine, and it was actually – Ovaltine had been around for quite some time. Long time. Ovaltine yeah, yeah. was like the first like multivitamin. I that shit. And yeah, when, the re- when the research came out of what the benefits of it, they tied that to bodybuilding and went like, oh, well, we could, there's a whole mm-hmm. opportunity for a, a market here. And that's where the first powders came from. So they went into – uh, way isolate, concentrate. They talked all the difference in that. They got into twin labs. They got into, um, God, who else did they talk about that was really interesting? It was a really good documentary as far as the history goes. Oh, and I'll like check it out. How it evolved. Like, but yeah, protein powders went from being basically dry milk and then later on, you know, milk extracts. Then it went to whey. Um, the, the plant proteins back then were horrible. They were soy protein and it was just basically ground up powdered soy there, yeah. to, to, to today where you now can get you know like organifies protein which is a mix of plants which is better amino acid profiles it tastes really good it mixes really good it's come such a long way from the early days of protein there was a big player too that i was not familiar with um that was that bought up isopure designer and another one, man. They, it was a company I never even heard of. They were like, they were just, a, they bought them. They saw the opportunity. And they were they were a company that had dairy farms like- Ready. Well, yeah, yeah. so they were, they literally saw the writing on the wall with all these supplement companies, wow. bought like three of the biggest ones up. They already had, so they had distribution. They had the, the market already and uh, delivery system. And then now they had the production side of it. So they were, you know, all the way from stem to stern. And they just dominate. And I'd never even heard of them before. But wow. they were just the parent company. You've heard of Isopure, mm-hmm. Designer. Those mm-hmm. were all f- Twin Labs. Those were all very- Yeah, Designer was the first big whey protein. And they and they were the first ones to really um, market it in a different way than just attracting bodybuilders. Like mm-hmm. back then it was, uh, you know, science-y looking or it was bodybuilder looking, uh, or, you know, or very sex appeal with, you know, muscle, Twin Lab look. or And then all of a sudden they do this like very colorful- 
for everybody. Oh, in those days, it was the supplements were like Flintstone vitamins, or mm-hmm. you went to a, you you bought like uh, you went to like these herbal health shops. Yeah, and you would get supplements there, but n- most people didn't. It was like health fanatics that did it, or like you said, Adam, it was like the muscle building space. Today. You know, uh, a, a huge segment of the supplement market, when you count all supplements, is the average person trying to improve their health or skin tone or, you know, fat loss or, you know, energy, sleep, whatever. It's a massive market. And I hope it remains the way it's currently regulated, which is not regulated like medicine. They've oh, talked they, about, they, they yeah. talk about that in the documentary, too. Yeah, that like would just, be a terrible what a, what Yeah, a once they got into a, a Costco, right? Uh, what company was that? They got into Costco, like really. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that e- one was ES huge. got into Costco. Um, you know, they even share like so when Joe Weeder was coming up, there was two other guys that were on the East Coast that were simultaneously growing at the same time, which had a lot to do with where Tim Twin Lab came from. So Twin Lab mm. was like just as was was a growing you know East Coast business that ended up rivaling Joe. You Joe know what Weeder. supplement for Twin Lab was just the just crushed. Yeah, it was Rip Fuel. Uh, Rip Fuel. Rip Fuel. It was the yeah. first it, oh, that, that was that was the yeah. first Ephedra supplement. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So yep. they introduced Ephedra <laughs> into the market. That's what blew up. Bill Phillips introduced creatine. That's what that blew up. So Joe that's Weeder. all speed stack is with that too, right? The Rip yeah. Fuel. The family. original one. Yeah. yeah. That, but Twin Labs was the shit. first to 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 drop the Ephedra and you know they talk they they have a lot of people that they interview that are talking on the show that are talking about their experience when they were younger like you share like when you first in, and they're like oh my god this shit gets you shredded cuz you were like <laughs> fucking on one well you know? your appetite's <laughs> running yeah. in place your appetite's gone and you're in your in your hype you're stimulated it's definitely a terrible long term approach and it does have as its own uh, its yeah. own problems it's but damaging. but yeah you you i mean remember what you know what they use ephedra for you know if you go to the okay so pseudoephedrin is the the synthetic form of ephedrine, right? Ephedra in these supplements came from an herb called ma huang, which is a Chinese herb. Um, and what they, what, if you go to the store right now, if you go to the, to the uh, you know, uh, your, your pharmaceutical store or whatever, and you go to buy over-the-counter drugs and you go buy Sudafed, Sudafed is the synthetic version of ephedra, pseudoephedrine. Do you well, know what they used to make meth? That's too, right. right. That's why yeah. you got to give your driver's license yeah. every time you go buy a box of Sudafed. I mean, I've tried. So that's the shit that they take to make meth into. So yeah, you're not taking meth, but you're using its distant cousin, and that's what it feels like. You're oh, you're hyped. You're not hungry, <laughs> and you lose weight. You lose teeth too, and yeah, a lot a of other couple, things. Just a few so, teeth. You know what I'm saying? I know. Yeah. I went through a whole. It's fine. Yeah, I went through a period of using that all the time. Yeah, yeah. no, it was it was really crazy just seeing the whole evolution of uh, the supplement industry. Yeah, you know, it's so it's, crazy. It's been pretty wild. So crazy. Anyway, I, uh, you know, the other weekend when we were up in uh, at the house up in Truckee, I got the opportunity to hang out with Doug because we were in the car for a long time, and we were talking uh, about a lot of different subjects, but we started talking about training. And, um, you know, Doug started uh, just recently utilizing, you know, good old trigger sessions found in MAPS Anabolic consistently. And, you know, we're talking about, he's like, man, I, I always get blown away at the, just how well they work, which motivated me to start using them again. And I mean, really using them, you know, two, three times a day on the off days, the days you're not doing your hard workouts. Every time I do them, yeah. blows, I still to this day think that that is one of the most uh this universal um revolutionary training things that came out of of maps that I still think people still have yet to really grab onto I think it's challenging because you have to do it so often. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, that's why you just have to have bands that you tote around with you. If you've got them around and you've you've got the good habit of like, hey, when I'm watching TV or I have a break uh, from work or working on the computer and you start to incorporate it. But we were, I think we were talking and promoting it a lot more when we first started. Uh, I, we just haven't mentioned it that often. I mean, I feel like we got to re- remember that. You know, there's obviously a, a big portion of the audience it's, listening right now that are, aren't even familiar with what probably trigger sessions are. Yeah. So what's funny to me is, so MAPS Anabolic is uh, our, our most popular in terms of just numbers uh, uh, program, right? Most people uh, or most of our, our program sales or, or a, a small majority is- Well, we is encourage people yeah, to we, start there. That's our starting point. It is. And a lot of people love it, great results and all that stuff. But a big portion of those people had never consistently used trigger sessions, which is in the program. They have no idea what they're what they're missing. It's one of those things that okay. So here's a trigger session. If you don't know what that is, right? Trigger sessions are low intensity workouts, eight to ten minutes long, 
what you're doing is you're trying to get a pump in the muscle. You're feeling a little bit of a burn. I don't even like calling them workouts because then I think people think of it like, oh, it's like a scheduled yeah. workout I got to do. It's even less than that. Yes. It's like you're and spending, trying to get reps out. Yeah, you're spending eight to ten minutes, literally, at most, just trying to send just blood. Pump, pumping just pumping your some, muscles. Yeah. Get some blood into your muscles and calling it, it quits. You're not trying to break a sweat. Correct. You're not trying to freaking feel the burn and make it really hard. It's like you get a little pump. And you're done. That's all you got to do. That's it. And you do it a few times a day. So you want to do it really frequently, two or three times a day on the days that you don't do your heavy lifting. So if it's today's an off day, well, that's the day I'm going to do the trigger sessions. Um, and immediate, do this one, just do it once or twice. That's it. Once or twice, you'll see what I mean. Immediately, you notice kind of this all day pump that you feel in your muscles. Um, and then what, give yourself two weeks and watch what happens with the fat loss. It's one of the like the fastest. I noticed composition changes in a short period of time is from doing the easy trigger sessions. So Doug motivated me. I started doing them again, and it's again blows me away every single time. I always notice how how, much, how better I recover when I do it. Mm -hmm. That speeds up my recovery time when I'm doing that in between my heavy lifting. Yeah, I noticed that the biggest difference. And I think the challenge is what you're saying. People think it's a workout. Oh, I have to have access to a gym or weights. Yeah, it's easy. Go easy. Bring bands with you. Do them throughout the day. And, uh, and then just what I need what to do is what I did at my other house. So the other house I had, um, I had set it up in my living room where it was on the, like I had a closet door, like right by where our living room and the TV and everything was. And I just had them hanging, mm -hmm. <clears throat> hanging there. So I had to see it all the time. So it was like, if I was watching TV or I'd caught myself sitting there for a few hours, I'd get up and just do, you know, some chest flies. Yeah, those rubber them. bandits, they, like I, I would take, so they have that where you can put it in the door. Yeah. yeah oh, the yeah. little anchor, and I use that all the time. I have it like that, like at a closet or upstairs. I have it like uh, in the pantry, and so I'm just like doing that while I'm kind of waiting around. And I used to be real consistent with that. But, mm. uh, yeah, it is one of those things you just got to remember, oh, yeah, like this this is really beneficial. Like totally would energize, you know, the rest of my workouts too going back to yeah, it. Yeah, and I, I didn't, in, I mean, you know, it was in the first program, right? And it's like I invented it. It's it was versions of it have been used for a long time. You look at uh, you, uh, the Soviet athletes used versions of this kind of thing. I've heard other bodybuilders call them feeder sets, uh, where they're doing them in between workouts to give them themselves a better pump. Grease in the groove. Gre grease in the groove, or, yeah. or you've heard that term. Or uh, people how they work out in prison. Uh, sometimes in prison you don't have access to. So what do they do? They do. Push ups, little pump sessions. yeah, throughout yeah. the day, right, and pull ups throughout the day, and they get uh, phenomenal results. And then that reminds me, we were also listening to a podca podcast with Pavel. Pavel, uh, how do you say his last yeah. name? Setsuin. Setsuin. He was talking about the Soviet training technique that where you know how normally you'll work out, and then as you get stronger, you progress. So like, oh, add five pounds, add five pounds, add five pounds, or whatever. He said a very effective Soviet training technique was to pick a weight <clears throat> and use that same weight. Same rep, same weight, until it gets really, really easy. So first week, it's challenging. Next week, even though you think you could do more, do the same. Next week, you feel like you could do way more, do the same. When you feel like you could do a substantial jump in weight, that's when you, that's when you add the weight. So instead of adding five pounds here and there, wait until you think you can add 20 or 30 yeah, pounds. he's focusing more on the skill. Of, yes. And like really learning that like uh, with the CNS and like being able to respond like at a higher level. Yeah, and if you research this technique, I can't remember the name, they have names for it, this type of training. It was uh, one of the reasons why the Soviets dominated everybody in weightlifting yeah. for so long was that technique right there. So Interesting. really, really cool. Anyway, so uh, Biggest Loser. We got to uh, talk about oh, it. Oh, we yeah. got to talk about this. We said we were going to watch it, and uh, did we all watch it? Uh, did. Yeah, we did. We did. So, what'd you guys think? Uh, <laughs> you know, here's the thing that I I, I noticed. I'm, I'm going to start off with the the positive thing, right? Like I had, so I haven't watched this in almost a decade, um, maybe longer actually, because uh, it was the first couple seasons. It's been that around I, for a while. Huh? Long time. Mm -hmm. It's been around for a long time now. In fact, Doug, look yeah, let's up. see how many seasons they've done. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Uh, I, I would get. I'm guessing 15 years. Um, maybe, Pro yeah, probably maybe, maybe more, that. maybe more. Um, my guess is 15. We'll see. And I know it's been about a decade since I've watched it. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I noticed right away watching it was how much, you know, even someone who's not a fan of the show, uh, how much I get sucked into it. They do, yes. they do an incredible job of casting, uh, the, 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 the people that are going to be on the show. So the biggest loser, uh, contestants, 
Uh, they do an incredible job of doing that, and they they do an incredible job of editing and and sucking you in emotionally. Oh yeah, like I and I don't know if it's the the, the new dad in me now or what, but I felt myself like holding back tears a few times. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, am I really getting pulled into this thing right now? How long has it been around? Oh, since 2004. Yeah, it looks like that. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. That's a long running show. Yeah. yeah, it definitely has that emotional draw. Like, I mean, like years. It, they do a great job of storytelling throughout the whole thing. And I think that's, I mean, that that's really what even I, I caught, like Courtney was kind of watching a little bit, like, because I was like, I, I got to watch this, you know, for the show and like give my fair analysis of it. And, you know, I'm already sort of like looking at, of course the trainer and then everything else that everybody's doing, but like the, the storytelling in there and like all the different types of people and their backgrounds, like it's very, you're very much sucked into that. Like I felt like immediately emotionally uh, pulled and like, I'm like, Oh, I felt, felt like, you know, just, just gut wrenching things sometimes with, with some of these people's backstories. So this is what it feels like watching the biggest loser as a trainer, right? Somebody I've, I've worked with people. We've all worked with people for decades and worked with, Lots and lots of clients. We've been doing this for, for a while. Lots of them that are just like these people. Well, a lot of them are just Very like similar. the people on, on this show. And it, it's, it's, it would be like, if let's say you're a, a, a Navy SEAL or a Green Beret in real world. And you go out and you do these operations and you do real shit. And then you watch Rambo. It's like that. Like you're watching Rambo. You see the guy with the bow and arrow shoot down a helicopter. And part of you is like <laughs> fucking bullshit this is not how, but then you gotta you just gotta take a step back and enjoy the entertainment right that's how i felt watching the biggest loser it is yeah, pure entertainment based it is it is exceptionally entertaining do not watch it for information on how to work out or eat right or any of that stuff because you're they're, not they're get not it. learning anything they're going to take with them that's possible no well, they're, 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 the way that people are being trained the way that they they're talking to them very entertaining very fun to watch it would be if you did that in the real world as a trainer, your long term success with your clients would be terrible. Would absolutely so, happen. and here's the thing that really, you know, bugs me or the part that I have a hard time with. I think watching it is, for example, the guy who gets eliminated the first, the first guy to get eliminated. Not fair. So he's, yeah. he's, uh, I forgot about that part. Like they eliminate people. I was like, oh shit. Yeah. Right. So the first guy gets eliminated. Right. And you know, and they ask the coaches, you know, afterwards, like, oh, what do you, what, you know, what do you think? And then they kind of give their response of like, you know, I've got to step up and just be a better coach or, you know, whatever. But the reality is like, there's a couple things going on here. One, uh, he's a 400 pound ex athlete football player. So high, high level. He was at college. Yeah. High level. So he is trained probably very intense in his life in the past. And he's also probably built a lot of muscle that he has. And we've talked about muscle memory and how your body uh, will respond. If you're somebody who is trained like probably he trained for a long time, uh, his body will probably respond to the weights a lot faster than everybody else's. Meaning he, from just lifting a little bit of weights, he'll probably build a little bit of, uh, a little bit of muscle mass. And then also because he's trained intense and hard for so many years in his past, his body is more adapted to that type of training than somebody who is completely foreign to that. Right. So the fact that he lost is no surprise to me. Like uh, I, The only reason why I may not have guessed him is because he had such a big weight discrepancy. But since they do the percentage of weight... That he'd have to lose a lot of weight. Yeah. Right. He'd have to lose a significant amount of weight. So it was inevitable that he was probably going to be the first one eliminated. And then, you know, of course, you know, Bob and, and then the trainers, they're, they're, you know, kind of baffled by this. What could it be? What do we do next? He gained muscle. Right. He, That's what I think because he, he has that muscle memory. He was an ex-football player, even though they were doing circuits, which is not very conducive for muscle building. You take somebody who had a lot of muscle at that level, loses it all, yeah. And they can do almost anything, and they'll gain muscle at twice the well, rate. Well, that, of and if right. he's also been somebody who's trained intensely mm-hmm. for uh, many, many years, uh, his body is more adapted to that than somebody who never has. Yeah. You take two people that are exact same way, obese, four hundred pounds. One of them is an ex-athlete, played sports. The other one is not. Sure, the the one that played sports has uh, the mental advantage because they've pushed themselves to limits, and so maybe they can have a higher gear to push them. But they're at a disadvantage metabolically because of how many times they've probably trained that way in the past versus the person who's four hundred pounds never done that before. So right. there's a there's a, a a very obvious reason why stuff like this happens. Meanwhile, uh, you know the the approach or the training approach 
Now, for winning the show, uh, it makes the most. And, and I, and yeah, I, if you want to win, how long is the time frame? I believe that. I, yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think look it up, Doug. I think it is eight weeks. I want to. I'm guessing eight or twelve weeks. Yeah, probably. I'm guessing. Um, but I know that they have two sessions a day of training. Um, I don't know if they're they're limited to the time. If it's an hour or two hours, uh, uh, the exact. Uh, limit that they have, but basically, I know they have somewhere between two and four hours of exercise a day that they they are allotted. Right, so in that time, we know that running and circuit training is going to right. burn the most amount of calories per se. The problem with that is, you know, after doing this with them for a week or two, and we'll see this as the show progresses, it's going to get harder and harder mm -hmm. for them uh, because their body is going to quickly adapt. Uh, to that high intensity, and then the the weight loss it's, will slow down. It's also just it's thirty weeks. It's also just a oh wow thirty weeks. Yeah, it's thirty weeks, and they're they're beating the crap out of them. They're restricting their calories really low, and that will cause a lot of weight loss. But the training is very inappropriate. Um, first episode, you see several people throw. They're up. throwing up in 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 buckets. Yeah, if and, you're oh my god, like just for me, like as a trend, that that to me is like the most cringeworthy part of the show that I have to like address that. Like, yeah. like that mentality, like it to me, it's just it just screams like a bad relationship with exercise going forward from then on out. Yeah, they're they're being punished. The motivation is very much you can do. It. You're never going to be fat again, and you know. If you train, if you're a trainer in the real world and you make your client throw up, you fucked up. Yeah. Really bad. You did a bad job. You trained them inappropriately. Um, that's not uh, a good thing at all. So the training is inappropriate for long term success, but for short term entertainment right. and short term winning this weight loss contest in 30 weeks, it's very appropriate, right? The same thing with the diet. So. You have to look at it through that through well, that lens. Well, and, it, and it, this is what I struggle with because then you the first guy gets eliminated, and then they, you know part of the show what they do is because obviously this was filmed earlier, right? So they they give you what he's been doing for like the last six months. So they film during the whole filming of the show. When someone gets knocked off the show, they still have a, a, a film crew that follows them and mm -hmm. does an update on them. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and I know they do this obviously for to to make it continually to stay inspiring and motivating. But you hear him talk about it, and he he uh, over that course of those six months, uh, he was down I think another forty eight pounds, right? Which is still way far from what his, where his, his goal is. He has done that through double days of training Oof. every day. Oh, so he's he, just been ramping up his intensity. Right. And he's he went through a three week plateau of where he didn't move whatsoever. And then his the way he talks about it is all about motivation for his son. And so we, we're playing on all these heartstrings of, you know, it's all about push and motivation and do it for your family and do it so you don't die. And it's it's driving into this, you know, hardcore mentality right. of pushed it's it's so you, that well dries up it, well exactly and eventually what ends up happening to these people is you end up putting all the weight back on and and the statistics on it are crazy it's like yeah. within the first five years they like 80 percent put on that that's not what the next 10 years and sometimes the people in the, that make the five-year mark i know erica's on five years now that she's been that she hasn't a lot of those people are just they've had the mental discipline to keep that that up. Like they're still training double days. They're still doing the, it. But here's the thing: that's not the secret to success. No, that's it's and inevitably that 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 you fall off of that. It, it may you're, be, you're one tragic thing in your life that happens. Yeah. To, of putting you're right that on all, the edge. Right. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah. There's your one hard hard rough injury tragic thing in your family away from. Letting that all, and then when it comes on this next time, it fucking comes on yeah. fast. Yeah, and and, and and for some people, for a very small percentage, that is the 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 key is that hardcore discipline and motivation. But the vast majority of people, it completely fails. Exactly for what you're talking about, Adam. You can't be in that mental state all the time, and you want to look at the environment of a, a show like this. You're leaving your home. You're not working. You're on TV. The pressure you're of completely in a bubble. You've got a trainer there. You're re working with a team. It is so different from your regular life. Then when you go back to your regular, see the secret to long term success is how do I Create integrate? Behaviors. Yeah, how do I integrate this into my life to where I can maintain this and keep it up and develop these good relationships? The show doesn't do that, but it is very entertaining. And I'll mm -hmm. tell you what, I think who do you think is going to be the winner. And I don't mean the winner on the show, but I mean which trainer do you think is going to become the most successful from the show? 
Oh, well, we said that Erica yeah. would be that. We knew Erica would be that. America is going to love Erica. Oh, she's yeah. she, great yeah. story. She's so likable. She connects so yeah, well. She's more empathetic with, you know, everybody there and, and has this sort of like, you know, like she went through the same kind of an experience. So therefore, you know, that they're, they're more responsive to that. But yeah, she just has more of that emotional pull, which is the whole show is about that, mm -hmm. you know, and and to see, you know, Steve Cook or whatever on the other end of it, it's just it, it just looks it it's completely different from him trying to hammer his way through everybody and get that like coaching discipline you know established yeah I, I, do you, have you guys done this yet where you think to yourself like okay how would i do this if i was on the show how would i do how would i both win the contest but also do it in a way to where i'm communicating things with integrity you brought that up and I, and i said to you it's not possible it'd be so yeah, hard, not in that right? environment and you think it's po I, I, not only do i think it's impossible but i also think that you what you would try to do wouldn't get aired Probably. Yeah, exactly. So you would just fuck yourself anyways. You would go in with like your attention. Boring. Like, they're like, we're not going to put that I'm, I'm smart enough to win this and teach them. Like, get yeah. the fuck out of here. No, you're not. You're going to get cream, bro. What will end up happening is you're going to try to do the right thing. You Because here's, how are you going to how are you going to keep these people motivated well, what I'm saying is to you, drive through these circuit workouts while you're also telling them, hey, in the real world, yeah. I would never train you like I this. I think it would be conversations, but you're right. They wouldn't air it. There's no way. It wouldn't be fun. It wouldn't be exciting. And you would also, you got to think, right now, the everybody is, is throttling down on the emotional button on these people it's mm -hmm. all about your diet you're going to die it's well, all about for 30 your weeks that's the way you're going to win right 30 week period right so sure. but if you're going to communicate to them that hey in the real life this is how you should be training i mean if you let them in on that secret you know that that's yeah. this is not the way to do it who the fuck in the right mind is still going to be motivated if they're if they're so motivated about staying alive longer or changing their lives and you're telling them the real way to change their lives is not this way but hey to win this competition right. we're going to do this like yeah right, right yeah, well, the, well the reality is if if they had a contest like this uh okay. like let's say it was like the biggest loser but real like good trainers and appropriate training and good diet in a 30 week period, be boring. It'd be so boring it to watch. Be, it would be boring. And here, how about this? You'd be like, oh, he's stretching them. You, you yeah. know who, you know who, who <laughs> well, wins, the, walking who and, wins and the biggest award for me after watching episode one is Planet Fitness. Oh, wow. Planet Fitness <laughs> yeah. gets the big W on this. Cause let me tell you, not only are they fucking 2,000, you know, 2,000 locations now. Wow. So not only are they wow. exploding and they got their hands into this this show, but they're also this is their demographic right here. Oh yeah. We don't these are the people we don't this is exactly who they want. The oh, people they sponsor the the New Year's Eve ball drop, everything, and then now they're sponsoring this show. They're outfitting it with we all their want equipment. The, we want the people that are gonna come for the free pizza, yeah. try to work out hard for a little while, give the fuck up, but still keep paying yep. their membership. Mm -hmm. That's that it. is their clientele, man. They are literally marketing beautifully. Yeah. Hey, like, by the way, hey, this you is tried it. Good job. Yeah, this, no, this is, keep paying me. This is not a dig on people who sign up there. And, you know, look, it, whatever gets you in and it makes you feel better and you're trying things, that's, that's a very, very good thing. I know how hard it is to get started. But the business model for gyms for a long time, and, and Planet Fitness is the best at this, it, and it, you can tell by their pricing structure. They're very, very low priced, lots and lots of gyms. And you think to yourself, how can a gym profit? Because they're expensive to run. People don't realize how expensive a gym is Very to, expensive. to run and put together. Millions of dollars get started, lots of money in, in paying staff. It's a big facility. How do they make a profit when they're charging 15 bucks a month or 10 bucks? Right, and only 500 people yeah. are allowed to fit in here at yeah, once. Exactly. They have a lot of volume, a lot of volume of people that pay a very small percentage of them actually use the gym. Because if everybody who had a membership came to use the gym – it wouldn't have enough room. So the model literally is to target people who will initially sign up, but then not come. That's the perfect model. That's a perfect uh, and avatar what, and, for a gym. And, like and a part of that is how do we keep them paying but not coming? Right. Oh, I got an idea. Let's throw them free pizza once a month. So when they, they go, feel like they're value so they go, their wait a second, I had four slices of pizza this month. That's $10 <laughs> like... Yeah. Fuck it. Pays like, for itself. I'm, I'm not going to stop paying for this because if, if I want my money's worth, all I got to do is swing by on Fridays, grab a slice or two of pizza, and it warrants my $10 a month. And it's fucking brilliant. And when you sit there, and you know, I know this. I know this because 24 Fitness, although was far more expensive when I was there, they still kind of had a little bit of this model. And it's when you're sitting at home going through your finances and you're looking, oh, we need to save some money. And then you go, what about this $10 a month? gym membership. It's 10 bucks. It's not that much. You know what? I really should go. I paid a little bit of a joining fee. Let's just keep it. Yeah. And cause it's only $10. What is that? Two coffees? Not a big deal. 
And so they keep a shit ton of people who never use their gyms and it's like pure profit. Yeah. And it's low enough to where it's like the idea that they're still have a gym membership is just all they wanted anyways. You know, it's like, oh, I I still, I'm still a member. Yeah. So funny. So along the lines of brilliant schemes, this is an old one, but I had to share this with you guys. I don't know what I was doing. I came across uh, this article and then I just, of course, uh, went down the rabbit hole, started reading more about it. But it was on uh, Allstate, and Allstate mm-hmm. did this in in 2015. It was called the MayhemSale.com. Did you guys know anything mayhem about this? Mayhem Sale? Yeah, Mayhem Sale. No, because I've seen their commercials where it like like prevent you from mayhem, and he does like crazy shit. Yeah. Oh, what about the dude that okay, so, the super low voice? So that's <clears throat> Justin's Allstate. Justin's yeah. hitting it on the head. That's what that. That's who that is. And that the the way they launched this so this campaign so this campaign ran in 2015 and it was don't overshare in social media so the idea of the campaign was that that if their insurance company right is to tell people that hey you know right now we're in this new social media world where everyone's sharing things like that you can get robbed easily and so what they did was they set somebody up they ran it during the Rose Bowl so during like when all the Mm -hmm. everyone's watching watching the game stuff. And what they did was they reached out to somebody, told them that they won two tickets to the Sugar Bowl, Sugar or Rose Bowl, one of those. Mm. They give these people the the, the tickets to the, the whole event. They're all excited. They go there. And of course, they're tweeting. They're at the Rose Bowl. And they're all excited. So what Allstate did, because they were already paying for advertising for commercials and stuff on the show, they ran a commercial. <clears throat> First, what they did was put up a fake profile of these people using their social media, showing that they're at the game and they're not home for burglars to go get their stuff. Then they they staged all of their, uh, their stuff that's in their house and they sold it online and then they broadcasted it live in the stadium <laughs> and on TV for people to see. <laughs> so these people oh, were shit. watching their shit get sold. It was this big thing. <laughs> To show how easy it was to, to show how easy it was to rob wow. them, sell all their shit online, and then all while they're at the game having fun, <laughs> telling everybody that they're not home, right? And they can't do anything about it. So it went so viral that, that uh, Allstate like made millions and millions of dollars. The website got like some of the most traffic ever by a website before. I didn't even know. I didn't it. even know they did that. I didn't know that either. Do you ever think to yourself sometimes that these brilliant marketers just give people more like more criminals better ideas? Like, <laughs> sure. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Well, well I think uh, I think I even thought of that. I think that was just brilliant marketing from Allstate seeing that that was something that was happening already. Because I do remember, um, you know, people saying things like that, like, hey, be careful how much you share on Facebook, yeah. showing your location all the time and stuff like that. Because, Post it when you get home. Right, right. So, you know, be careful of, of doing things like that. And I think Allstate saw that there was a growing awareness of that, and they just accelerated it by doing a campaign like this, which was, you know, crazy, hilarious, all this. How brilliant. No, that's so smart, man. Do you, do you guys remember that one company that would protect, like, your identity? I don't remember the name of it. And the CEO, to prove how awesome his company is, because what you do is you hire them, and their job is to protect you against identity theft. So yeah. the CEO, to prove his point, posted his social security number oh. on trucks and billboards. And he's like, wow. I'm not afraid because I have, because of my company. Anyway, he got it stolen like six of times. Of course he did. <laughs> he got it stolen like, a bunch of times. Baiting a bunch of hackers to yeah. have at it. Dude, totally, seriously? Totally like backfired. You know I, mean? <laughs> I did not, like, dude. you can't steal my identity. And they yeah. did. <laughs> they did a bunch of times. Dude. Oh my God. It was so funny. Uh, I did not, I did not hear deserve that. that. Yeah. Anyway, dude, so um, I've been getting this, this study that came out. You guys remember a while ago, that was like four years ago, we were talking about what new trends we saw in the future for fitness. And I was talking about how, oh, it's a matter of time before they start to demonize protein. Protein is going to be the the targeted macronutrient next. And it just, basically, the reason why I, I predicted that was because I went off of the, you know, carbs and, and fats were done. So what's next? Protein. But sure. It's only a matter of time before now protein. The, the whole vegan movement yes. and everything else. And then I saw the vegan movement and I said, oh, here we go. It's yeah. Because one of the yeah. criticisms against a vegan diet is that it's hard to get a lot of protein. Right. So and, let's like say and, that protein really isn't that necessary. Well, and that's their defense is yeah. that it's not. And to some truth to that, right? Yeah. Because they're right. Well, well, the yeah. message has been that we need so much of it. And then they're like, you really don't need that much of it. Well, the first, the first thing that the vegans tried to do was say, oh, you can get lots of protein through vegetable sources. And then they realize, well, this isn't working yeah, this very is well. It's actually pretty hard. Because yeah. really, protein sources from animal sources are easier. They're better on a gram per gram basis and all that stuff. So then the next stage, of course, was let's attack protein. So they're finding studies to show that protein 
may be bad for you. And this new one came out. It says that high protein diets um, could increase heart attack risk. Well, you have to understand, by the way, when you read these titles is could. Could is the operative term. And so in these studies, they find that high amounts of protein stimulate something called mTOR, <laughs> mammalian target rapamycin, which is something that is a part of muscle growth. It's not a bad thing, but in certain contexts, it can be a bad thing. For example, in a pro-cancer context, high mTOR could stimulate cancer cells. In a high inflammatory, high calorie, shitty diet context, <clears throat> lots of mTOR could prevent mitophagy uh, and could in, 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 could actually increase the risk of heart disease and issues like that. And so that's what these studies are showing, which isn't really ground, groundbreaking. High anything in the context of a high inflammatory, high calorie diet can be bad, like high fat, like high carbs. But this is the latest one now. So now they're going to start saying too much protein, bad yeah. for the heart, too much protein can cause cancer and all this other stuff. Can't wait. Oh, Can't coming. wait for this to start. Oh, yeah, start I wonder up. if, you know, we'll have to talk to Organifi and see if they feel a difference by by stuff like this, if they can even notice, or if it's just... I Sometimes I wonder if this is kind of like the, the alarmist strategy thing that we talked about before, where they'll take one person who's like crazy that's saying something and then be, make it like a big deal where it's like, no, I don't. I think at the end of the day, most people understand the importance of getting protein when it comes to building muscle. There's plenty of research around that. Yeah. So are we going to fall for this demonizing it? Is it, or is it just a few people that are alarmists that are trying to say that, or a few people that are trying to defeat, uh, uh, defend veganism that are saying it. And really the majority. Dude, it's so it. funny how predictable it is. It's just like, they're going to go from one macronutrient to the next and they just keep, it's like a cyclical thing. Cause it's like that way you can sell specific products and, and you know, divert people from this way of doing things to now, like we're going to, jump on to this way of doing things and it's just like a matter of you know a few studies that will will they'll try and like yeah vilify whatever it is they're trying to vilify so everybody jumps on board well, well demonizing it, fat and protein is funny to me because they're essential well and yeah, yeah and exactly. to, have to have them to me proteins are so we're is, having to balance is a hard one especially in the muscle building fat loss community i mean when i was watching that documentary that that is the one thing that like of all the things uh, to make a case for uh, that have value, it's you know the, the protein powder. Mm -hmm. Just because a majority of people struggle with getting enough protein, especially if you're weightlifting. So if yeah. you if you're weightlifting and you're also dieting to get in enough protein intake on a regular basis, unless you're a you know the you know, the one percent the bodybuilder who carries around six chicken breasts a day. Right. If you're the average Jane or Joe and you're getting into exercise and fitness, mm -hmm. one of the most valuable supplements that you can get your hands on is a protein powder. Which I would say, like, yeah, most people. So they're trying to vilify uh, protein, but the that one percent, it's like your gym bro, it's like your bodybuilder, it's like that's those are the people that are the ones that you know would even fall in that category of like overuse of right. protein. Yep. Otherwise, and, and, it's not even a thing. And again, context matters. I'll even go in the reverse. Sure. Sugar, right? Sugar, we know, has potentially some bad effects on people, especially when you consume a lot of it. But sugar, even a higher sugar diet, if your calories are low, way less dangerous for your body, causes way less problems. And there's even studies that show that it doesn't cause any issues in the context of a low inflammatory, low calorie uh, type of diet. So but now when you calories are really high, if you're eating more calories than you need and you're constantly in that state where your body's gaining body fat... Uh, you, you can have a great diet made up of healthy foods and you're still going to have some health issues and high protein or high fat or high carb in the context of a lot of calories. Each one of those I could show problems and issues. So you, context makes big difference. You got to pay attention to that. Right. First question is from Ansari Jr. My joints always seem to be hurting. I work out four to five times a day, take fish oil and stay hydrated throughout the day. Am I doing something wrong? Four to five times a day? Yeah, that's probably that's what it says. I'm sure he was a typo. I hope so. Because then maybe that's why your joints are. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That explains everything right yeah, there. You might be working yeah. out too much. <laughs> Back off the workouts. <laughs> the, the, here's the places that I would look with clients who had um, pain, you know, kind of chronic issue pain in their joints. Oh, by the way, there's there's two general types of pain. There's the chronic variety. This is where like, oh, my knee's been hurting. It's been bothering me on and off for the last five years. And there's the, there's the acute variety where it's like, my knee hurts. Why does it hurt? Yesterday, I twisted it, so I'm actually injured. Mm. So I'm going to assume that this person, and he says always seem to be hurting. Yeah, chronic. Has the chronic uh, variety. So the first place I would look is movement. Always. You know, your, your joints uh, will last you your lifetime. Mm. 
and they'll feel relatively good your whole life if they're moving optimally. There is an optimal way. And they're way. supported. That's right. If they're moving in an optimal way, then they should do, be doing pretty well. It's like, um, you know, this reminds me of a story. So, you know, years ago when I bought my first house, there were some doors that were hung already. I had remodeled the whole house, but there were some old doors that I didn't change. And the doors just kept making sounds and noises every time I'd open and close them. I'd grease them up and they'd keep doing it. Finally, I had my dad come over to look at it. And he goes, well, this, the way that these things are hung, the joints, the, the the hinges are being stressed more than they should be. And it's this is the reason why they're grinding and making all this noise and why yeah. the door isn't opening and closing the way it is. We have to set this up so that the hinges work optimally. Okay, so that's like your joints. If your joints are moving in suboptimal ways, they are going to cause, they are going to have pain over time. So poor mobility is usually, is always the first place that I look uh, when I would have a client. Well, and, okay. and, and to that point, taking supplements for it is like oiling it. So it's fixing the, the squeak for the moment, but it's still not fixing the root cause. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're going to use supplements to help aid that, which I think is, there's definitely value in that. But you can't stop there. You can't just take your fish oil, take your turmeric, take something like that, uh, and then that think that resolves the problem. The problem is in the way your body is moving, and this is you know this is where Maps Prime Pro came yeah. from. I mean, this is why we created this. It's designed to uh, address every major joint in the body. Uh, there's a test for it to see if uh, how you do, uh, and then there's movements uh, connected to it that you should do to uh, perform uh, better mechanics and to support that that joint. Yeah, this is where the conversation of posture, you know, really comes into play, and like really understanding how to line yourself up and stack your spine properly to where uh, everything is is in an optimal position. So, what does that even look like to start? A lot of times, people don't even put that kind of work in before then trying to uh, you know go through these movements and put stress on them by adding weight. So. Uh, it, it is one of those things like, or, or over time, it's, it's something that was very subtle, very, very subtle angle or something that was a little less optimal that over time, you know, the, the volume of it has, you know, created this pain and created this, you know, signal of your body of like wear and tear. And so to be able to come back and address it, you really need to dive into that specific joint how it's functioning, what your end ranges are, like how much strength you can, uh, you know, connect to. So how, how connected are you uh, in rotating it, moving it, getting, you know, flexion extension uh, and seeing what the quality of that is and then really staying there and, and trying to express that even further. Yeah, think of it this way. So think of a sliding uh, screen door or a sliding glass door. And when you look under the door, there's a track. <clears throat> And then there's the door glides along that track. And typically there's like a little wheel that it glides on. And if the door is balanced, it'll slide back and forth on that track and it'll do pretty well for a while. Now imagine if that door, there, were pre there was pressure on that sliding door pushing it back. There's just enough pressure to push it back to where rather than balancing right on the track, it's grinding a little bit on the side because there's a little bit of pressure there. Now, initially, you might not notice the problem. You slide the, the sliding glass door or the screen on and on. You don't notice the problem. But over time, because that, ba that door is not balanced and moving perfectly or optimally on that track, over time, you start to create problems. The wheel starts to grind. It starts to roll improperly. And over time, you start to, to, to cause problems. This is what happens to your joints. Now, oftentimes, it's not the joint itself that's the problem. Oftentimes, if your knee hurts, it's not because the muscles on the, around the knee aren't doing what they're supposed to. Oftentimes, it's because surrounding joints aren't moving properly, and your knee joint is just compensating. It's just doing more than it should, more than it needs to, and this can cause lots of issues. So that's the first place that I would always look. And I had a lot of success with this. I would say seven, you know, 70% or 80% of the time, I could successfully get someone's joint pain to get a lot better just through working mobility. There's a there's there is a diet component too, though. Yeah. Um, I noticed this with myself when my diet is poor and it's it's in an inflammatory diet. If I drink a lot of alcohol or I eat a lot of processed foods or I'm not well hydrated, 
I can also start to feel stiff mm. and start to feel pain. It restricts pain. Mu- movement and, and causes more pain. And I think that, you know, lowering that inflammation is something to consider. Right. And then you have this like this this feedback loop where it's like, okay, I'm stiff because I'm eating foods that promote inflammation in my body. Sometimes it's a food intolerance. Other times it's just a general overall bad diet. Now, because I'm stiff because of that, I'm moving in a way to try to avoid that pain. But now I'm creating movement patterns that are also not ideal. So now I'm actually causing joint pain. So then you get this kind of spiraling effect that causes more and more pain over time. Well, that's the the value of the supplements, right? That's the value of using something to help aid, bring down inflammation. So you then can go put in the work. Yes. It's like foam rolling. Like we talk about too. It's like another tool. you're, you're alleviating something temporarily right now, but it doesn't mean you're not fixing the problem like so you in order to fix the problem you have to go to the movement but there is value in using tools like that to bring down yes now when it comes to you know working with inflammation trying to bring it down through taking something you have the like really strong over-the-counter drug uh, options which are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen uh, is a good example aleve uh, you know naproxen is another good example Now, the problem with those is that they block inflammation. They don't modulate inflammation. Blocking inflammation, very strong anti-inflammatory effect, very strong. Hmm. My pain is, wow, it's way better. You take an Aleve or you take- Isn't that hard on the liver too over time? It is. It's not only that though, blocking inflammation can actually uh, promote problems in the future. Studies now show that the chronic use of anti-inflammatory drugs- causes joint degeneration or joints to degenerate faster because inflammation is essential to send a signal to your body or as part of the process of the body to repair and heal. So, uh, and for example, there's other studies that show taking anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen post-workout reduces the muscle building effect yeah. because you're, you're, you're blocking the signal. You're not modulating it. So inflammation, you want appropriate levels. You don't want it to be gone. I like supplements for this, because if you take a supplement, for example, um, Organifi's Move supplement is phenomenal for this. I've been using that, and I love the way it works. So it has ingredients like uh, high potency turmeric. It's got holy basil in there. Pine it's got bark. Pine yeah. bark, which yeah. contains pycnogenol. All of these things have been shown to modulate inflammation. So they don't hammer inflammation like ibuprofen would, but they help your body produce a more appropriate inflammatory response. Now that being said. If you're not drinking enough water, you're not getting good sleep, and you have a really shitty diet, uh, it's like you're 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 putting a band aid on a problem. It'll help, but it's not going to help enough to overcome your poor diet and all that stuff. It, but if you do work on your diet, you do work on mobility. I do think supplements like Organifi's Move, maybe throw some fish oil on top of that in high doses if it, that's appropriate for you. Boy, they they can make a pretty substantial difference. I've noticed huge differences in myself. Um, and then my clients, that's usually that's my approach. Typically, is like, okay, we're going to go mobility. Yeah. We're going to look at diet, hydration, Definitely and sleep. Mobility, and then we're going to throw some supplements that can help with this kind of temporary high inflammatory state, so that we can move better uh, in our workouts. Next question is from Lean Queen twenty nineteen. Can you build muscles that you can't connect to? Yeah, that all rhymed. Yeah, <laughs> no. we, yeah. We, well, we need to correct this first, or be help be accurate with yeah, it. You're so, connected to all your muscles. Yeah. So unless you're paralyzed, um, you are connected to your muscles. When we refer to poor connection, what we really mean is just a movement pattern that's not conducive to developing that muscle. So we'll use a squat as an example. When you're squatting, you're using a lot of muscles to do that squat. The, the main movers would be your quads, your hamstrings, and your glutes. There's more muscles than that, but those are the big ones, right? So let's say you're squatting, but the way that your movement pattern is set up, and maybe you develop this because you sit a lot or you only run or whatever, the movement pattern means that your movement pattern may have more quad doing more of the movement than glutes doing the movement. So now when you do lots of squats, you build big quads, but your glutes don't seem to get that much of a response. Um, This can be true for a lot of exercises. Bench press, for example, you may be able to get a really strong bench, but you notice your triceps and your shoulders really get well developed, but your chest doesn't. Changing your movement pattern, or was like we like to say, connecting to the target muscles better, can change how effective that exercise is for your target muscles. So, you know, the way she said it isn't ideal, but yeah, there's some truth to what you're asking too. Like if you have a poor connection or 
you have a, a less ideal pathway to like your squat and your goal is to build your glutes and your quads are carrying most load. Yeah, it's it makes it it doesn't make it impossible. It makes it very unlikely that you're going to develop that muscle very much. Like your glutes are going to work if you're going to squat. Uh, even if you have terrible recruitment pattern, they're still working. They're getting some work in there. It's just not dominant. And if it's not dominant, it's not getting the loudest muscle building signal. The muscle that's most dominant that's taking care of that movement is getting the loudest signal. It's going to it. That's where the body's going to adapt and grow more muscle. Yep. So it's not that you're you're not actually connected to it. We're connected to all the muscles. It's that you're not using it properly through the movements that you should be. And if you don't address that, then yeah, it's going to be very challenging for you to try and develop that muscle. In fact, there's you know, camps of people that, you know, anytime they see somebody that has an underdeveloped muscle, they always relate it to poor connectivity. Yeah. They, they don't have a very good Well, there connection. is a way to consciously recruit more muscle. And I think that's what we speak to that in, in being like taking the time out to really try to, uh, you know, like summon more from, uh, you know, neurologically, like to, to be able to really focus in on, you know, trying to activate, uh, you know, certain muscles and get their involvement, uh, you know, within the movement. So there is a way to really consciously like focus in on that and improve that process, but uh, which then in turn, you know, will, will help the muscle to develop. So Well, and this is the inspiration of MAPS Prime. So we talked uh, the last question, uh, shamelessly plugged Prime Pro, uh, but that's what that was designed for. You got joint issues. You're trying to address that. You want to figure out the right way to do it. You're not looking just to put a Band-Aid. You want to fix that chronic pain. That's what Prime Pro is for. Uh, if you're looking for some, to get better connected to certain muscles because you have muscle imbalances like most people have, uh, MAPS Prime. That's what priming is for. It's mm -hmm. designed to help you get connected to the proper muscles before you go into exercises, and that's why we created that. Yeah. And that's why they're standalone programs because we know – that those things are so challenging for people that it should be a program by itself to figure that out for you. Yeah, like, yep, yep. Now, and and the the people or the athletes, I should say, that are just the best at learning how to connect to muscles. Besides correctional exercise specialists, um, they're really good at this for for functional purposes. But in terms of just developing and building muscles, bodybuilders, bodybuilders are the experts of the the resistance training world when it comes to figuring out how to connect to a muscle and figuring out how to feel and develop a particular muscle in a particular exercise. And you can watch really good bodybuilders will do a, a, an exercise and you can tell they're targeting the glutes in that leg exercise or they're targeting the quads in that leg, leg exercise. And it is funny. You'll notice this. I don't know if you guys notice this, but you'll have clients who, you know, oh, I squat and lunge all the time, but my glutes don't develop well. But what do they have well-developed? quads mm -hmm. or, Oh, I bench press all the time, but my chest doesn't develop and you, but I'm really strong. And you look at them and what do they have really well developed shoulders, shoulders and triceps. Yeah. You know, I had a client years ago who was a, a competitive arm wrestler, um, both hands. He was highly competitive, both right and left. Of course, arm wrestlers use a lot of biceps and forearms in their sport. And when we did back exercise, first off, this guy could pull tremendous amounts of weight in rows. He could do one arm pull-ups but it was all arms. It was all arms when he would do them. So he would do all these rows and stuff, and his arms would get bigger mm. and more developed, but his back wouldn't get a lot of stimulation. So I had to teach him how to connect to his back with a lot of these exercises. And he had to change his technique and form and feel completely, even though he's doing the same exercise, just so he could connect to, again, quote unquote, connect to or target the muscles that we were trying to work. So if you're trying to develop your body, it's not just enough to do the right exercises. You have to do the right exercises the right way. Yeah. If you don't do the right exercises the right way, believe it or not, the right exercises can be the wrong ones for you. Not only can they be terrible for developing the muscles you're trying to work, but they can even cause problems. And I'll give you a great example. Um, it, one of the best exercises for somebody who needs to correct forward shoulder, that's the the posture where the shoulders roll forward is a row, a cable row, for example. Best exercise you could do for forward shoulder. But if that person is doing the row with just their arms and their shoulders are forward and they're just pulling to their midsection and shoulder stay rolled forward, not only are they not going to get benefits, they're actually going to make their forward shoulder worse, even though it's the right exercise. So it's very important that you do the right exercises the right way. Otherwise, you're not only going to not get results, but you'll probably get the opposite of what you're looking for. Next question is from Just Another Mike. 
What are your thoughts on the carnivore diet, and how long should you run it? I think if you... Um, You're well, not just another mic. Too. If you like uh, <laughs> ice cream and cake and popcorn and tortilla chips, it's a fucking terrible diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you like any of those things or want any of those things. Or your- fruits and vegetables <laughs> and nuts <laughs> and anything else yeah. that's not me. I mean, I think it's terrible. It's pretty uh, limiting, yeah. Uh, you know, do now, do I think the science to support uh, the health benefits of all of it? Like, yeah, there's a select group of people that are going to do really, really well. But actually, there's probably a big majority of people, if they switched from the American diet and they went to carnivore, they'd see all kinds of health markers improve and if the, if you're a carnivore advocate that's going around talking about how great it all is these are the things you're sharing you're talking about what happens when you take somebody who is on all these foods and then you put them on a car all these markers well, are- if you have autoimmune issues you have yeah. like SIBO you have all these different like underlying issues and you're limiting it down to one nutrient source that's you know but, like pretty manageable right so it's incredible for that yeah, but it seems yeah. I mean I, I I remember when I was on the ketogenic diet and I fucking wanted to shoot myself yeah I mean I can only eat so many macadamia nuts and olive, olive oil, oil and butter and yeah <laughs> it's like <laughs> you're yeah. like what am I and, supposed and, to you know this? it's a lot of fun at first just like I think if I were to do the carnivore diet like yeah, i steak love four times a day. Oh, i love, I love ri- steak i love burgers yeah i love ribeye and that try much? to yeah but at, at one point you know i, I want a yeah. little balance so you know uh that's how i feel yeah. about the any and here's the thing too this is not just for this diet it's yeah. for all diets yeah exactly yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and people need to understand that like this whole the whole diet world is just it's designed to to divide and conquer all of you mm-hmm. that are you know it's like wow well, yeah like ha- it, I don't, I don't it, understand why they're so adamant about like like having everybody conform to one well, specific thing. It well, doesn't work like well, that. Well, the carnivore diet has all the, the makings of a successful marketing-wise and fad-wise type of diet. It's got all the, 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 the wonderful- it's extreme. It's, it, it eliminates the one food everybody told you was super healthy or the two foods, right? Fruits and vegetables. Huh? You got my attention now. Yeah, I always hmm. hated vegetables. This, is a, this sounds interesting. It's low calorie. All diets that make you lose weight are are low calorie. I don't care what kind of diet you follow. And why is a carnivore low diet? You've just eliminated almost all food. <laughs> yeah. um, and eating only one thing, you're probably not going to eat that much. I don't care what yeah, that one gonna thing. It's going to be really hard to get calories. That's 100% like what I experienced like going through it too. Yes. And, it's, and it, it's the thing is like you just get like full, you get satiated, so you get like all of that going for you. But it's at the end of the day, like, man, it was a real big challenge to just meet my cal- caloric needs. It's also basic and simple. And if for a diet to become successful right. marketing-wise – it has to be clear and simple. Don't eat carbs. Don't eat fat. Don't eat vegetables. Don't eat meat. Whatever. It's 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 people like that. It's very catchy. Like, oh, I can do that. I can just eat meat or just eat, you know, no carbs or whatever. Um, so the, it's got all the makings of of something that could be successful marketing wise. Now, in terms of, is it a good diet for people? So there's two things I want to say about that. One, there is no perfect diet for everybody. None. Um, I don't care who you are. First off, there are going to be some people that are going to do well on a carnivore diet. My guess is the vast majority of them have lots of immune reactions to other foods. Mm-hmm. They have lots of food intolerances, and carnivore diet's the ultimate elimination diet where you eliminate most foods that people might have reactions to. Um, so that's and that's the that's the big thing about this particular diet is that some people have a lot of food intolerances. They eliminate that. You know, like Michaela Peterson, great example. She had some legit immune issues and eliminating all those foods made her feel really good. And for her, for her, I have no doubt that this is the best diet, but for most people it isn't. The second thing is this, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Because I think there's a lot of people that are like, wow, I only ate meat for a month and I, I didn't die. And they think, oh, that means it's a good thing. No, not necessarily. I mean, you could eat the, you could eat the typical American diet for you know, 60 years and not die either, um, that doesn't mean it's it's ideal as well. It's very extreme. There's lots of value to consuming a variety of foods, vegetables and fruits and nuts, and even grains have their own well, values. Well, and, and some of the values that I think are important that, that when you eliminate them in a diet like this is the ones that we talk about that aren't just nutritional value. It's not always just about that. Sometimes mm-hmm. like 
you know, try being the guy who has to tote around, you know, a, a tri-tip everywhere you go, <laughs> yeah. and you're at a birthday party, or right. you're at a, you know, a, a dinner party, or you're going over for somebody's uh, having wine and cheese event. Yeah, now you're like, a social leopard. Right. So, uh, and if those things are important and you like to do that stuff, I think that, that eliminating that, <clears throat> it becomes really challenging. And so, uh, per- personally, and we've done it, I've... I, aesthetically I've been able to keep myself in good shape running all types of different diets. Now I haven't done a pure carnivore, although I've ran keto, which is close. It's just even less stuff. Right. Uh, and it kept myself in, in great shape. So if it's just about getting shape, you could do anything. You could do vegan, you could do keto, you could do zone, you could do, they all work and have success well, with people. Yeah. And, and they're, and you have a lot of people who are navigating the diet world and they're, they want to lose weight or whatever. And it's like, oh my gosh, everything's so complicated. What do I do? Do I count macros? Do I count calories? Yeah, this is the least complicated out of all of yeah, them. Yeah, it's like, hey, dude, just eat meat. You'll lose weight. Yeah. If you just eat meat. <laughs> and it was like, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. I could totally do I that. I think that's where the appeal of it is, though, yes. I'll be honest, like even for myself. But, you know, like I know there's a, like a short window to it. And like, it, again, looking at it from an elimination perspective, I think like there's some value to that. But other than that, the other value is that there's a counter to veganism. So I just, I appreciate that from an entertainment value. Yeah. That's yeah. really the only thing I can it's, think of. It's so funny because they're in the same, without realizing it, they're on the yeah, same. They're like at war. They're yeah, in the same camp they're though. They're the same. Yeah. Because you know they're saying? so extreme. Oh, yeah, no, they're both extreme. Next question is from Nan Duff 61 How often should you take diet breaks and how long should they last? Okay. So if you're doing everything right, then there isn't a break. And there it's, isn't a diet. There isn't a diet. Yeah, right. there isn't a diet either. Yeah. It's just eating. It's like it's, that. It's eating. It's eating. It's, it's like the scene from uh, <laughs> the scene from the Matrix. You know, when when, he, when Neo's waiting in the waiting room for the, the Oracle for yeah, in the first oh, one. The spoon. Yeah, 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 and the kid's bending the spoon with his mind, the little bald kid or whatever. Yeah. And, and Neo's like, oh, you know, how do you do that? He's like, I can't do it. And he goes. The key is to realize there is no there spoon. There is no spoon. So, oh, yeah. yeah. That's really the key to proper eating is to realize <laughs> that is. you're not on a diet. Yeah. You know, it's just how you eat. And what does that mean? That means that sometimes yeah. you're going to go to a birthday party or you're going to enjoy yourself with your spouse and you're going to eat food for the sake of its hedonistic value. Because, yes, that is a value for the sake of the enjoying it. So sometimes, you know, we just came back from a, a trip with we all had our families together and you know, there were a couple meals that we ate and we drank, and the entire value of that meal was hanging out with you guys and the hedonistic value yeah, of, of we were, fun. Of when, we were, when we were at the slope snowboarding, we were we all had uh, you know carne asada tacos beers. and chips and guac and beers, like because that sounded amazing after riding and burning three thousand calories. Mm-hmm. You know, what I'm saying like, to, and I'm going to enjoy that at that time uh, and not worry about it. And I, I'm not taking a break from the diet. It's just. Um, and, that is part of your diet, right? And and I think I think how I I try and help somebody who asks questions like this too is to understand that doesn't mean too that I, I I'm giving you carte blanche to go do whatever the fuck you want. Just eat. Well, every time you want bad food, you eat bad yeah. food, mm-hmm. or whatever. Every time, or and now that I said you can have chips and yeah. guac and beer, you go have chips and guac and beer all the time. There's there's moments where I make the decision that then there'll be you know three days before that where I'll come home from work. And it's been a day where I've been at my desk all day long. I didn't get my workout and this, that. And Katrina goes like, hey, I'm, I'm craving uh, five guys tonight. Do you want some? And I'm like, oh, man, that sounds so good. But no. And I go, no, because I know I didn't move all day long. I didn't get my workout in. Yeah, the, it sounds good right now because I haven't eaten much. And a burger always sounds mm-hmm. pretty damn good. But I also know that I'm also not, it's not a major sacrifice to pass on it. And you know what? I'll have you know, some taco salad tonight instead, or I'm going to have the chicken breast that's in the in, in the refrigerator from yesterday instead. And it's not like I'm fucking sacrificing a lot right there. No. But if I if I feel like it's always on or off all the time, then you're playing this this game that you can or you can't. It's not that you can the, or you can't. It's just, no, I don't want to do that the, right now. The root of the problem with it is not realizing the total value of food. So I'm going to give you two scenarios, both unhealthy. Scenario one is the nutrition freak, the fanatic. The only value they see in food is the macronutrients, like proteins, fats, carbs, the calories, and how it fuels their body. Now, why is that unhealthy? They have, any, they have an unhealthy relationship with food. They can't enjoy themselves with their friends. They probably have you know, missed lots of opportunities to develop relationships. They never 
enjoy food for the moment, for the pleasure of it. I've worked with a lot of these people. You see a lot of them in the hardcore fitness space. They're dysfunctional with their eating because they only see food for its but it's it's nutritional value. Now on the flip side, which is most people, because that's not a lot of people, but they they exist. On the other side, you have the other people who only see food for its hedonistic it's value. Yeah. Yes, all the value of food is how it tastes and how enjoyable it is. That's and if you and you know this because you when they decide what they're going to eat, that's what they base their decision off of. What do you want to eat? Let me think about it. Oh, I feel like Mexican, or I feel, and it's all based off of its hedonistic value. How oh my god, the taste of it, the smell. The enjoyment. Now, that is a value, just like the nutritional values of food are also a value. But if you worship one and you don't understand the others, you have dysfunction. What you really need to do is understand the total value. So in the example that Adam, that you gave, it's like you came home and Katrina says, let's get five guys. And you recognize the hedonistic value. Oh, yeah, that does sound like it's going to taste good. But then you realize the other value, the nutritional value. And at that moment, it's more important to you. That's how you develop balance. This is why you won't need a diet break because this is the internal dialogue that you have with yourself when you're deciding what to eat. What is more valuable to me at this moment? Right now, I'm with Adam, Justin, Doug, and our families. We're up in Lake Tahoe. We're at a ski lift. We haven't hung out together that you know in a way that wasn't business related. And right now, what I value is I want to enjoy this beer. I want to talk to my friends. I want to have this carne asada taco and have a lot of fun. Most of the time, that's not the case because most of the time I'm just feeding myself. And so I'm going to value the nutritional stuff for food. But if you have that approach, then you don't have a diet break because here's what a diet break encourages. It encourages you to go on your diet and off your diet, Mm -hmm. which looks like restrict and binge. That's exactly what it looks like. It's like right now I'm on a break. What is a break? Anytime you take a break, what does a break look like? I'm going the opposite direction, everybody. Right. I'm on a break. I'm going to eat everything I want. I'm going to go crazy with the cake and the, and the alcohol, and then I'm going to go nuts. And then, uh-oh, got to get back on the diet. What does that look like? Perfection. It looks like restriction and perfection, and we all know how that, that relationship and it, works out. it takes a lot of extra calories just to put one pound of body fat on. Mm. So it's, you know, you, you may be thinking right now, like you know, we the the two Coronas I had and the four carne asada tacos – that's what maybe a thousand calories, you know, maybe or so. That's not even enough to put one pound of body fat, especially considering that I'm going to be riding and moving around mm-hmm. like crazy. It's it's the compounding effect and the spiraling down that ends up happening to people when they yeah. when they get on and off, the, and that's what that relationship promotes: the, the I can or can't have, or I'm on a diet break. That diet break now turns into a I'm going to eat whatever I want because I'm on a break, and then now it it goes from the thousand calorie lunch that I'm enjoying with my friends because I'm on a ski lift to the every day, every meal for the next five days, I'm over consuming. And now I've over consumed 7,000 calories. Here comes the two pounds that I added. It's mm-hmm. just too neurotic. I mean, like people just need to relax. Like it, like all, like for me, it's about seeking foods that I know, like the nutrients of it I need. And I want to like, get foods that make me feel good and and, and help to promote, uh, you know, like better movement and and, and keep me active and and healthy, like foods that make me healthy. Now there's going to be times where it's not available, whatever. I don't want to sweat about that and like hammer myself about that. The more you hammer yourself about it, the more, again, you you get into that, that like, okay, well, I'm going to go off the rails. And then it just becomes more of this accelerated thing. I've known lots of people. I've known lots of people in our space who are fanatic. Addicts uh, about their nutrition and exercise, but it's such a stressful way to live, and that it's and the fact that they don't have lots of deep relationships. The only relationships they have are with other fanatics. Yeah. They don't like to go out with friends. They don't like to go to parties. They don't like to connect with people, or they judge people for not being as fanatical as they are. And so, what they end up doing is harming their health because stress, relationships. Documented. This is documented. Scientific studies have shown that those things are as important to your health as your diet. So it's like you're going to take one and completely destroy the other one. You just traded one for the other. So you might as well eat bad and have good relationships. It's not that big of a difference. So it's it's really about, look, if you want to navigate in a modern, prosperous world where you have access to all these foods – all the time, because I mean, let's be honest. For most of human history, we're kind of forced to eat healthy because that's all that was available. You know, you didn't you, when you're a caveman, you're not walking by a McDonald's or, or Chinese food. It's like, what do we have to eat? I don't know. Go kill that or pick that thing over there, and that's what you, what you can eat. So we live in a very prosperous world. 
the only way you're going to navigate it right is to have that type of relationship with food. Otherwise, you're screwed. You are screwed and you're going to go on and off and you're going to have breaks mm -hmm. and you're going to get on the wagon and now I'm serious and oh, now I'm off and it's just going to end up with poor relationship and poor health. Yeah, get rid uh, of the wagon. In the long term. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our resources and guides. They cost nothing. Go check them out. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal and Adam at mindpumpadam.